So hopefully you know that which talk you're supposed to be in. Hopefully, you know, this, you're all in here for the friendship. Amen. Okay. So when they told me to, uh, to, to, that, that I was going to give this talk, someone was like, oh, I'm not so weird, Stephonic. No, sorry, that's, I'm not him. Um, but like when they told me I was going to do this talk, like on, on friendship, I was like, this is like the most ironic thing ever that I would give a talk on friendship because it, it, like friendship is not a... I'm not the best at friendship. You know, I'm not the best. You know, I have a, a couple of people that I call my friends, but I'm not the best at friendship. If, if the people who know me know that, you know, I'm pretty, it's easier for me to just be by myself. You know, that's like, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with when, like, not, not a lot of attention is on me, which is kind of ironic that I'm up here speaking to you right now. But, like, um, like friendship has never been, like, my, my strong suit because, like, when I was growing up, uh, there was a lot of transitions that went on in my life, and I, I was never, I never learned how to really get close to certain people, and when I would try to get close to people, it would always end up, like, messed up in some, some way. When I was growing up, um, like, uh, you see me right now, and, you know, I told you earlier, my name is Brian, and I'm from Washington, D.C., and, and people begin to think there's, like, a stigma from uh, a guy from Washington, D.C., you know, he's from, he's, let's, let's, let's call a spade a spade, he's a big black dude, and he's from D.C., and, you know, there's a, there's a stigma, so... Uh, when I was growing up, uh, like, I am not, like, a hood guy. Like, I can fake it really well, but I'm not a hood person. My father is a doctor. He just retired, and my mother's an office manager. So I was, like, king of the burbs growing up. I grew up in the suburbs, right? That's what I was, right? And I went to an all-boys prep school. So that's the, the level of my thugness. But when I was growing up, my father wanted me to go to a really good school, so I went to this um, this school in Georgetown, which is a wealthy area in Washington, D.C. I went there, and, um, I, you know, I did okay there, but I didn't do as well as I could have done. And then my mother decided to, to, to flip it up on me. So, you know, I went to this school in Georgetown. I was, like, the only, I was, like, a raisin in a bowl of oatmeal. I was the only, like, black kid in, this, in, in, in my class, right? And then my mother decides to flip it up, and she doesn't, like, like transition me slowly, right? She doesn't go to, for a little bit of diversity. She puts me in the school in, like, the middle of the hood, right? So it's like in Northeast D.C. So and that totally shifted my, my life because when I, I was just getting adjusted to life at Trinity in Georgetown and then I'm in like the middle of D.C. So it's like one weekend I'm listening to Phil Collins. This is kind of, I'm kind of, you know, I'm older, right? So one weekend I'm listening to Phil Collins and I'm listening to Madonna and all this stuff. And then the next weekend it's like N.W.A. and, and Public Enemy, right? So I would go to my, so I'd be at, I, I went to my new school. And, um, which is in the middle of D.C., and I would be like, hey, guys, did you hear that new Phil Collins song? It's really rad, because that's what we said in, like, the 80s. And they'd be like, they'd, like, smack me on the back of my head, make fun of my pants. And they, they, it, was just like, it was just, like, really messed up. So what began to happen was I began to get really self-conscious about myself, about who I was and the way that I, I portrayed myself to other people, um, because I began to learn that, you know, I can't be real. I can't really say what's on my heart. I can't really be who I really am, because... If I become that person, then people are going to make fun of me. And that really affected, like, the friendships that I began to have because I learned to be fake at an early age. And I can tell you all this, too, because we have some fake people in this place right now. Like, just keep it 100. You know, not everyone is authentic uh, right now. Uh, you know, this is just, that's just what we learn. We, we don't really learn in our culture that it's okay to be who you really are. Some of us right now, we'll praise and worship the Lord Jesus and we'll stand up, we go to the altar call, but when we go back to school and someone says, do you believe in God? Ah, I don't know. Uh, some of us, we can jump up and, have we ever gone and see for, I don't know the song lyrics, I'm sorry. But, you know, yeah, but we, we can do that right now. But when we go back to school and someone challenges us about that, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a different story. So I'm just telling you this because, you know, we learn that who we are is not good enough. We learn not to be real. And I learned to do that. Like, when I was growing up. And then what began to happen was, you know, I got sick and tired of trying to be someone that I wasn't. I just got sick and tired of being around people and not being able to be honest. Not being able to laugh with my friends because I was afraid that if I laughed with them, then they would see my faults and they would start to make fun of me. I began to get sick and tired of that. And um, what began to happen was I began to get used to being alone. And I can be honest because some of us in here are, are like that right now, you know. You know, we've been hurt in the past, we've been broken in the past, and we've began to say, you know, forget about all these other people. It's just easier for me to be alone. But deep down, like, if, if you're like me, deep down, I, I always wanted 
to have, like, friends. You know, I always wanted to, 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 to be, a, I wanted to have someone to, that would accept me or a group that would say that, you know, hey, look, 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 Brian's here. So, you know, even in my times when I was trying to be alone, I always yearned for something, for something more. And then in high school, I, I, I began to act out in certain ways because I wanted to have those friends. And what happened with me is in my effort to get friends, I didn't really care about what I did or how I carried myself. So I began to take myself down paths that I probably shouldn't have taken myself down. And the normal thing in Washington, D.C., which is probably true in every, like, major city everywhere, you know, uh, I learned that I had to be, like, a tough guy. So I began to listen, like, the guys, you know, I was talking about this earlier, I began to listen, like, to, like, to, like hardcore rap, even though I was living in the burbs, you know. So I would listen to, like, DMX and, uh, 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 you know, all that stuff. And I would listen to, to, listen to Tupac, even though I, had, I, I, had, I couldn't relate to them at all. I began to listen to, like, South Central Cartel because growing up in the 90s, anything from, like, the West Coast rap, that was like the hardest you could be. So I began to listen to that, even though I lived on the East Coast and my father was a doctor, you know. Like totally faking, all because I wanted uh, to have friends. I began to act out in certain ways. I began to like, like try to be tough and, and try to have like a lot of girlfriends, which, you know, I, you know, I mean, I'm not terrible looking, but I'm not like a beauty king. You know, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not that. But, you know, so, but this is what I learned. This is how you act to have a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of friends. And I began to surround myself with like a lot of people. And I can tell you this because some of us do the same thing. There's people in this room right now, there's people that I know in, in my life, in high school and in college, that they're not comfortable with being themselves and we just take ourselves down different paths and we sacrifice our integrity to be something that other people want us to be. Because deep down we're afraid that we're not good enough on our own. And just because we're in a Steubenville conference, it doesn't change anything, too, because then, like, the, the, the test gets to be a little bit different. It's not, do I really love God? It's, you know, do I look holier than the next person? When the Eucharist comes out and my flat face on the ground before my friend next to me, you know, it, 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 it transitions, it, it, it changes until we really begin to know who we really are, we begin to accept who we really are, and we begin to really know what true friendship is. And the Bible talks about this. In the book of Sirach, it talks about that there's different types of friends. I have a, um, a five-year-old daughter, and uh, she kind of imitates kind of the way that people view friendship nowadays. I talk to my daughter, and I'll take her to, like, the YMCA to, like, I'll go work out. She'll, like, play in the, the jungle gym. And um, after about an hour, I'll go pick her up, and uh, she'll come back, and she'll be like, Dad, I have a new friend. I'll be like, okay, what's your friend's name? I don't know. I was like, oh, okay, and then, or I'll take her to the mall, and um, she'll, like, say hi to, like, a little girl, and then she'll be like, Dad, this is my new friend. I'll say, okay, hey, okay, what's your friend's name? I don't know. And, or, or, or she'll meet someone at, at like, a camp, and she'll be like, uh, Dad, she's my best friend. I'm like, okay, what's, what's her name? Sarai. Okay, what's her last name? I don't, I don't know. Or what's her favorite color? I don't know. But she's so quick to throw out the, the term friend because she's so hungry for attention that, like, that's what she does. But I think the same is true for us. Like, we get so hungry to call, out, to call someone our friends that we sometimes give that title to people that don't deserve it. We do that a lot. Um, and as you get older and, and as, as we get older and as things get more intense, we do a lot of other things in the name of friendship that we probably should not do. So we throw those things. That's why in Syriac it says this. When you're searching for a friend, make sure you discern who your friend is going to be. When you're looking for friends, you have to discern those friends. Because there's people in our lives that are what we call fair weather friends. Let me get that uh, first slide up. If we can get it. I don't know if we have it. But there's people in our lives that are like fair weather friends. Friends. Like when I was in high school, I had a lot of uh, fair, fair weather friends. I don't know if you can, or you, uh, okay, you, you, uh, oh, you can't. I know. Well, we're all black, so you can't see which one. <laughs> you, you can't tell which one I am. Um, but uh, this was uh, this was my group right here. This was my group of. This was what I thought was was my crew. And like, if you see, like, I'm I'm about to get really politically incorrect. Um, the light skinned guy. And right there, and, and like, <laughs> if you see that little butterball in the back, like with his face, like that's me right there, you know. And that that that, that kind of sums up 
my view of a, a friendship in my high school experience. Now, the reality is this. We all look like we're like some tough guys, right? We all look, we all look pretty, like, thugged out, right? Um, we all went to an all-boys prep school, so our prep school is out of the picture, okay? Um, we all just got out of, like, gym class or something. So we're in the – now, all of us, our parents are either senators, doctors, or lawyers in, in that picture. So none of us were tough. Um, and most of the guys in that picture are either accountants or, like, teachers or something like that. So that just shows that we weren't as, as tough as we kind of thought we, we were, you know. Um, but, you know, growing up, you know, th that was the group that I said was my – they I said that they were my friends. I tried to imitate those guys because that's kind of what I knew. But what I began to learn is this, that a lot of the guys, even though they had, like, pretty good intentions, uh, they weren't always the best influence with me. And they weren't the people that were there for me uh, when times got really hard. They were there for me when, when things were going great, when I had a lot of stuff, when I was pretty popular, when I was playing football really well. They were there for me in those situations. Um, when, if I was having a party, they were there for me. In certain situations, they would give me advice. But when times really got difficult, when there's like a death in the family, or I made a mistake and I needed someone to, to, to encourage me, or when I was going through with my parents, um, those guys, as, as great, and I don't want to like, like put them down, as good as they were, uh, they weren't always there for me. In, in those situations, even though I labeled them my friends. And I tell you this because some of us have people in our life that are just like that. And we call them our friends and uh, we get broken hearted. But the book of Sirach, the Lord says this, we have to discern who is going to be our friend, who we give that title to. See, there was, um, let me go. He says this. In Sirach, a faithful friend is a sturdy shelter. He who finds one finds a treasure. A faithful friend is beyond price. No sum can balance his worth. A faithful friend is a life-saving remedy, such as, he who, such as he who fears God finds. For he who fears God behaves accordingly, and his friend will be like himself. So what begins to happen is this, you know, as I got older and I, as I began to learn a little bit more about life, I began to find my faith and I began to see like what the true nature of friendship is supposed to be. And I began to understand this, that when I'm searching for a friend, I'm searching for someone who's trying to lead me to truth. In this world, we have a lot of things, a lot of people that will lead us to distraction, but we need people to lead us to truth. People that we can stand on that will lead us to God, that will let us know that in our darkest moments, in our most uh, like stressful times, that there is hope for us. That there's more to our lives than the superficial, superficial status quo. We need people to really speak truth to us, to be with us. And that's what I learned in my relationship with God. That there is more to me and that there, are, that there is more to relationships, that there is more to my relationship. And I think that's, what, that's kind of what sums up what a friend is called to be, what we're kind of searching for. We're searching for someone in our life to bring us truth, to let us know that at the end of the day that we're not alone, that when we're struggling, when nothing else makes sense, that there is hope for us. And I know we've seen it like last night, we saw it this morning, but if we haven't realized it, the key to us finding true friends is our relationship with God. Am I willing to trust in God? Am I willing to look to God and see what the standard of my life is supposed to be? I wanted to uh, tell you a quick story. There's a, a guy, a student of mine, who used to teach in New Jersey. And um, this guy, his, his name was Mike. And uh, Mike was one of the kids that when I was a teacher, he was one of those kids that like, really didn't believe in God that much, but he was never absent for class. He didn't really believe, but he, he was always like a stressor for me. So I remember one time we were doing a retreat, and I was leading this retreat, and it was called the prodigal attack because it was like mimic the, the story of the prodigal son. And uh, Mike was there, and I said, Mike, I want you to go on this retreat. Now, Mike was a kid. He, you know, I didn't know his past, but I know he'd been broken somewhere in his past because he got to be into that, like, the gothic culture, the goth culture. And um, I was talking to Mike. I said, Mike, I want you to go on this retreat. And Michael said, uh, no, Mr. Greenfield, I'm not going to go on this retreat. I said, Mike, I'll give you 25 extra credit points if you go on this retreat. And Mike said, okay, fine, I'll go on the retreat. So he ended up going on the retreat. 
And um, he got on the retreat, and we were talking, giving the same talk that I'm giving to you right now. We are talking about friendship, and I was talking about the gifts that, uh, that each of the kids in the room had. And I, was, I went to each person. I, tell, I was telling them their gifts, how unique they were, and how God was working in their lives. And um, then I got to Mike. When I got to Mike, I started telling him the story of, uh, you know, how, how much of a gift that he's been in my life and, you know, the good things that I saw in him. And uh, Mike did the weirdest thing because people never really do this. He raised his hand while I was speaking. And, um, you know, I looked at him, and this had never happened to me before. And I, so he raised his hand, and I said, uh, okay, Mike, uh, what do you want to say? And uh, Mike said, Mr. Greenfield, don't say that to me. I was like, wow, Mike, I, I see the gifts inside of you. He said, no, Mr. Greenfield, don't say that to me because, you know, I, I don't have gifts. And he said, Mr. Greenfield, don't even say it to me because I hate God. And I was like, okay, you know, at this moment, I don't, I don't know kind of what to do. I'm looking to my friend who's helping me out with music, and he doesn't know what to do. So, you know, I'm trying to just ride this out. I was like, Mike, stand up. Why do you hate God? And he begins to talk to me about his life and what he's gone through in the past. He told me this story about how when he was younger, he used to go to youth group. He was a kid that would go to youth group every Sunday. And he would try to live it out because his youth minister used to tell him that, you know, if you believe in God, then uh, good things are going to always happen to you. If you trust in God, then everything is going to be okay in your life. And what began to happen with Mike is this, that he began to trust in God and he began to try to follow God. And he would go back to school. And uh, when he would get back to school, people would see his faith as a sign of weakness. And they would make fun of him um, because he was trying to be like a good kid. And he said this, he was like, Mr. Greenfield, you know, I tried to follow God and they told me all these things about what it was going to be like. I was going to have all these friends and people were going to support me and people were going to love me. But when I went back to school, it was the total opposite. People made fun of me. People put me down. They wouldn't invite me to parties. They wouldn't want to be near me because they thought I was some sort of Jesus freak. And they thought that like my faith in God made me weak. So what Mike said he did was this. He said, because that made me weak, I began to believe that anything other than God would make me strong. So I began to hate God. So that's how he got into the goth culture. And he began to do a lot of other uh, self-destructive things because he didn't trust in God. And at this moment, you know, I don't know really what to do. I'm getting frustrated, you know, and my friend isn't really much help. Um, but what I began to do is this. I began to ask his friends to stand up. And I told his friends, I said, can you tell Mike a gift that he has? And his friends would stand up one by one, and um, they weren't looking to get anything from Mike. They were just looking to speak truth to Mike. They stood up one by one, and they began to say, like, this is a gift that I've seen inside of you. You're trustworthy. You're honest. Now, these were people that, you know, that had God in their hearts, that were trying to grow closer to God. I see God inside of you. I see that, that, that you're a good friend. And they would go one by one telling Mike these amazing things that they saw inside of him. And then finally the last person to get up was his brother. And his brother gets up and his brother just begins to share his heart with Michael. And his brother says something like, um, Micah, you know, our life is not perfect. You know, our family is not perfect. But through it all, you've been a good brother to me. You've watched out for me. You've taken care of me. There's been times when I wanted to give up on myself. Um, but you didn't give up on me. And then what I began to see was Mike, this like, tough guy with this tough exterior, with this hardness of his heart, I began to see his countenance begin to lower. And I began to see that um, his, like, you know, his, his lips begin to quiver, and you know what's going to happen next. And his brother kept telling him how much he loved him and how much that he was with him and how much he supported him. And then, you know, Mike, uh, he just burst. He began to cry because for the first time in his life, he felt that he was loved. By another person. Now that's what we talk about when we talk about friendship. We all need people in our lives that see the best inside of us. People that aren't trying to use us. People that are, that are trying to get us to a better place. At the end of the day, that's kind of what we're all searching for. And until we realize this, that the solution, that the answer to that problem is a daily decision to follow Christ. We're all going to be putting our love in different places. Trying to find love in superficial things and things that take us further away from God than closer to God. And the reality is that all of us have been through it. The answer is this. Putting our hearts and our trust in God. Because when you trust God, you begin to realize this. That people can't treat you just any way. 
when you trust in God, you begin to realize this, that there's a standard to your life, that there's a beauty inside of each and every one of you. And there's a beauty inside of each and every one of us that everyone doesn't deserve to be near. And there's a standard for your life. When you trust in God, you don't take what other people say to be truth when you know that it's not. When you trust in God, it challenges you to love people deeper with with more intensity than you naturally would. Why? Because God loved us with all that he had inside of him. And we imitate that. That's what happens when you trust in God and you find your truth in God and you find your friendships rooted in the Lord. Some of us need to have a true friend. People that, someone that sees our hearts and is not trying to use us. Doesn't just see a beautiful girl that can be used for something, but sees a beautiful daughter, child of God. If we don't let God into our hearts, and if we're not the friends that people need us to be, there's people around you right now that have been bullied, that have been broken, that have had suicidal thoughts, that have had sexual things happen to them that have struggled with abortion, they're around you right now. And God brought you here in this moment. If it was last year, it would have been something different, but in this moment, to be a friend to those people. To not just say amen, to not just sing a song, but to make those claps and make those amens mean something. If you want to know about friendship and what friendship means, it starts with God. It starts with looking at the person next to you and saying, you know what, I don't see an accident. I don't see a mistake. I don't see someone that is just there to be used. I see a brother. I see a sister. I see somebody beautiful. I don't look at you the way that other people look at you because I believe in God. Because I know that God is real. And I see what's amazing inside of you. That's what we need right now. And I tell you this, there's people in this room. You all know each other better than I know you. And you all know the pain that goes on in your youth group. You all know the pain that goes on in your hallways. At the end of the day, there should be no one that leaves this place without being encouraged and knowing that God is present in their life through you. At the end of the day, when it's all been said and done, if we're real, we're all broken. Amen. We're all a beautiful mess. But the beauty about the way that the Lord does things is um, he brings us together to heal one another. To heal one another. Listen, and I'll close with this, and then um, we'll pray because I'm pretty sure that my time is pretty much past due. Um, We need each other. Amen? We need each other. We need the Lord inside of one another. We need that. Because none of us are strong enough to do this world on our own. I have a son and I have a daughter. And one day they'll come to a conference and they're going to need you to speak to them. We need one another. But it starts right now. It starts with us not running away from the pain, but allowing the Lord into our hearts, allowing the Lord to work through other people with the love that he's put inside of us 